Have you ever met somebody so unusual, so remarkable that they literally change your life forever? I am here to let you know you could live a thousand lifetimes and not even meet somebody like this person I'm about to introduce you to. And you could live 10,000 lifetimes and not have a friend this good and a person this honorable come into your life. So congratulations uh, for being, watching this video. And we're going to talk about family business and creating legacy by leveraging, investing in the stock market. It's going to blow your mind. I want to introduce you to my 41-year-long, lifelong friend, David Mitchell. David, glad to have you here, brother. Good to be here. Now, I'm going to Hello, ask everybody. you some, I'm going to ask you some questions. Um, I'm going to ask you some questions, but I want to tell people a little bit about you first. So, so David is a pastor in Corsicana, Texas, but he's also a businessman, and he was a businessman before he was a pastor. Um, and he was also, before he was a businessman, well, not before he was a businessman, but before, long before he was a pastor, he was a youth director and a Sunday school teacher um, for a bunch of teenagers in a church in a little town called Mejia, Texas. And there was this girl in his church that was 16 years old, and when she came to Christ, she, um, she was just on fire. And he and his family paid for this girl to go to college. I met her there, and she became my wife. <laughs> and um, so it's, it's, it's a remarkable story. And I could tell you, we've had, we've, had, we've had so many experiences through the years, but I have seen this man do things that I've not seen anybody else do. And, and the reason I'm telling you this is because, you know, Tony Robbins says, if you want to model any form of human excellence, find somebody who's doing the thing you desire to do and model three things. Model their belief systems, model their physiology, and model their syntax. And his belief systems have impacted my life more than any other person probably other than my parents. And I, I, I don't know if you remember this or not, but I remember one time as an entrepreneur, he had, he had this really big thriving business and I had a much, much smaller business and he had a bunch of employees and I said, hey Dave, how many, how many employees do you have? He said, I don't know, 60 or 70. He was real calm about it. Um, and I said, doesn't that make you nervous? He said, nah, Charlotte and I have been praying for years that the Lord would give us a business so we could hire Christian people and pay them so they could take care of their babies. And I'm thinking, who thinks like that? <laughs> right? And so that's who we're going to talk to today. And we're going to talk about family business. And you've got five children, 13 grandchildren, and all five of your grown children work with you in your business. That's mind-blowing. And their spouses. And their spouses. And my children too. So. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Their spouses are... So it's, it's mind-blowing. So David, glad to have you here. I know you, I know you believe the Bible and business, and you're really big on this thing of family business, and you really help me understand it practically at a very high level, and biblically, because you're one of the best Bible teachers I've ever heard. So talk to me. Talk to these folks about why you believe uh, family business is the best way to create legacy uh, for, for generations. Okay. Well, I, I think it's, it's a great question, and you don't hear it much in America anymore, sadly. No. But if you, if you went to the beginning of our nation, um, I don't know, a large percentage, if not maybe 90% of the people, had a family business. And a lot of it was agricultural. You know, they, they would work on the farm together or whatever their business was. If they owned a store, they would teach the kids the skill sets. And so I, I talk to people a lot uh, around the country when we do our tradeway meetings. We'll talk about um, what I called um, the old system and the new system. Mm. And I'll say, you know, the, the new system is, okay, what you do is you, it usually makes people a little angry when they hear this mm -hmm. because they start thinking about it. But I'll say the new system is you take your kid who you love more than anything and you send them off to college to learn something no one in the family's ever done and to be taught it by someone who doesn't love them to go work for someone who hates them. Mm. The reason they hate them is because if they're very smart, they're afraid they'll get their job. Mm. So they're not going to teach them the skill sets, not all of them, right? And then to trade your, as you've said so many times, your infinitely valuable time for a little bit of someone else's money. Mm. That's the new plan. The old plan in America, and the plan, I was fortunate, and you know my story. You've right. been, you lived in my house, so... Um, I was a fourth generation family business person. My great grandfather got us in the oil business in Texas uh, years ago. It took him his whole life 
uh, to work in the oil field, and when he was in his 60s, he bought that oil field. And then, he, he, then they fracked the wells. And some, I know you've heard that's a bad thing. It's a good thing, actually, um, especially if you're in the oil business. But anyway, <laughs> so, <laughs> so he made enough money that next year to pay the banks off. He, he borrowed about 80% of the money to buy that oil field. And it was the largest oil field in the world just a few years before he bought it. And so then he bought some in East Texas and West Texas and so forth. So what he did was he taught every skill set. He spent his entire life in the oil field just working out there. Mm. So he knew everything from the bottom up about how it works. He taught all of that to his favorite daughter, who was my grandmother, Mm. and her husband, who actually was the first guy in the family to have a a college degree at it, an accounting degree or something. Mm -hmm. And he... You know, he was taught all these skill sets, so the company kept growing, and he had a bunch of, this is a real problem, he had a lot lot of money laying around, he didn't know what to do with it. (laughs) So he had to learn, my grandfather had to learn to be a good stock and bond trader. And I can remember sitting on his knee when I was little, listening to him talk to a broker, because back then you didn't have laptops and stuff, you had to just (laughs) call him on the phone, you know, I need you to buy 500 shares of whatever. And I learned so much, a little kid, but my grandfather was a real oil man. I don't, I don't think I may not see him in heaven. He cussed like a sailor. Well, no, like an oil man, which is worse, <laughs> way worse than a sailor, let me tell you. You should see how he used to get me out of bed when I would spend the night over there anyway, because I don't like mornings. <laughs> You've heard me tell how he did. I can't say the words. No, no. But anyway, so he, but I would sit there and the, and the stockbroker would try to tell him, hey, Mr. Hall, all the, these are three great stocks that came down the pike, and you need to buy some of these. And he'd, he'd wait a second or two and start cussing at him, say, I already got my list. Let me tell you, just forget about that. I want you to buy this many shares of this, this many shares of that, and this many shares of that. And I learned from that, at, I don't know, maybe eight years old, that you don't let your broker or your financial advisor tell you what so to good. buy. So you, good. May, you learn to make your own list. So, but I learned so many things. And, and then my dad, you know, all, the, all those skill sets were then taught to my dad, all right, and my mom. And so they taught them to me, and I taught them to my five grown kids, and now we're teaching them to our 13 grandbabies. And so here's what happens. Every generation, not only are you passing down the skill sets of my great-grandfather, but my grandfather was a pretty smart dude. He's the one that was learned to do stocks. So now you're, you've got the great-grandfather and the grandfather skill sets going to my mom and dad. And my dad was a pretty smart man. He was a special agent Mm. with the FBI for 17 years back when it was good, when J. Edgar Mm. Hoover was alive. Mm. And the only only reason he quit, he he met my mom as a 35-year-old bachelor working with the FBI. And my real dad died when I was about a year old. And about a year later, some little old ladies in town introduced my mom to Fred Mitchell, who was the FBI agent. And so two years later, my grandfather talked him out of retiring from the FBI and come and run the oil company and taught him all those skill sets. Mm. Now you got great grandfather, grandfather, and my dad, and I got the benefit of all those skill sets. And then I've learned a few That's... things and taught them to my kids. So you pass those down. And not only that, any ideas the kid has, the family finances it, you don't have to go to the bank and pay come the interest. Now. So now, Are now y'all you're creating up on that? generational wealth. So, so which plan you like better? You want to send your kid to learn to do something no one's ever done. He has to start over every generation. I've never, mm, I've never seen it's wealth insane. created that way. It's, no, you can't because they can't. They don't have enough momentum. You don't have enough you have of generational time. momentum. Yeah. Right. Generational momentum, y'all. Wrap your mind around yeah, that. So, so we really don't teach stock market. And then you we learned that. new skills that yeah, yeah. your father and your great grandfather and your great grandfather didn't exactly. Have. Then you've taught yeah. those, and so now your children will have even more skills. Right. So here's what's fascinating to me, Dave. Like, we know about the magical compound interest in the stock market, mm-hmm. like the magical compound asset interest. Right. But the thing you just talked about is a different kind of compound interest. Mm-hmm. It's the magic of compound attention interest. Your grandfather, your great-grandfather got your grandfather's attention. Mm-hmm. Your grandfather got your father's attention. Your father got your attention. And now you have your children's attention. And all of this attention that compounded over the years to learn these new skills and have poured all into these these young people that are just doing stuff that we couldn't even begin to imagine when we were their age. It's mind blowing. Yeah. You know, I've got my second born daughter, Katie is here. She runs Mm -hmm. uh, Tradeway. She's the COO of Tradeway, runs all of it. And uh, her husband, Dave, who, who also, I don't make any decisions without talking to the two of them. 
And now it's kind of the other way around. Now they're making all the decisions, and sometimes they talk to me. But I kind of like it that way because I got 13 grandbabies. Yeah, there you go. And you can go play with the grandbabies while they're making decisions. Yeah. Yeah. And then uh, so Dave and Colin are back there. Colin uh, married my oldest daughter, uh, Jenny, and he's back here. And these young men, they're, they're my sons. I mean, they're, they're just amazing. But th- from the get-go, they saw this idea. And their families didn't necessarily grow up. I was fortunate to, to grow up in a generational family business. I mean, that's odd in America today, wouldn't mm-hmm. you say? It's just not One, normal. And I so can, I didn't I, know I, it was I literally normal. can say, I'm 62. I don't think I know anybody else who's a fourth-generation family business owner. I, can, I don't know anybody else. Even... Second or third, I mean, maybe some second, but no thirds. It's, it's pretty yeah. remarkable. And so these, not, you know, my sons and daughters-in-laws all picked up on that and wanted to be part of it. So all 10 of them work with me and Charlotte and our family businesses. Mm. And we own three businesses, but Tradeway is the one, you know, I love Tradeway the most, uh, even more than the oil company. Um, but it's, it's Yeah, it's, so it's let wonderful. me ask you a question about that, if you don't mind. You inherit a family business that's an oil business, so like clearly you are doing quite well. Mm-hmm. So there are a lot of people in here, maybe not in here watching on YouTube, who would think, yeah, but once I get enough money, then I don't have to do anything. Why in the world, if, you already have, if you're set for life, your kids are set for life, why would you go start another business? <laughs> <laughs> it's like, I think, I think people think, because of this whole idea of retirement, people buy into this idea that the objective of work is getting to the place where you don't have to do it anymore. But clearly, yeah. Yeah. people who are successful don't think like that. They, they don't have time for freedom. They don't want it. Mm. If, if what you mean by that is you just go do get nothing. on a boat and lay there all day. Yeah. I mean, that's, no, not, that's yeah. not what you do. Okay. You do it sometimes with your right. grandbabies, you know, right. for fun. Well, for one thing, um, I spent... Uh, uh, a lot. My, when my grandfather died, the, the stock and bond trader, he gave me all of his bonds. Mm-hmm. Uh, it helps. Here's one thing. If you can arrange to do this, it helps you with the wealth thing as you grow. If you can arrange to be an only child uh, <laughs> legally, <laughs> that works. Because my mom was an only child and so was I. So, and my grandmother, her, the, the good son died in a company plane crash. The bad son got disowned, so my grandmother was like an only only child. So that's three, that really helps. But anyway, (laughs) uh, other than that, um, I spent a lot of that money, as you well know, building the little church that I now pastor. Mm -hmm. I don't mean building it, but putting money money into into it. I wasn't the pastor. Charlotte and I were just members along with one other couple, and then you had a pastor and his wife. And we... We, we were the money. Y'all were, y'all were, the fun, y'all were funding the And church. the preacher knew that, didn't yeah, he? Yeah, well, he knew. He knew that we were the money, but we didn't know that he knew that. So we just given it to the Lord anyway. And maybe he misused some of it. Yeah. That's a whole other story. That, that's but between him and the is, Lord, but you were doing absolutely. your part. And so one reason I needed another company is I needed some more money. <laughs> okay. uh, and I got, Charlotte and I got to thinking, you know, what if the, all five of our kids don't like the oil business? Why don't we try to create a new company that has enough divisions where if they have an idea that's their own, we bring that in and make it a division and we finance it. It becomes so, part of that company. And we thought, well, so we thought, good. well, maybe, maybe one or two out of the five will, you know, work with us and the grandbabies will be narrow now. And then they all five wanted to. And, and yeah, like Ben, Ben was a surprise baby that came along, you know, after we had three that were like junior high age or almost. And, um, so Ben wanted to start something to, with, uh, precious metals. He didn't want to do stock. He, he's a great stock trader, by the way, but he didn't want to do that. So I said, well, st- start a precious metals division of Tradeway. So now we have one, and he built the whole thing. Wow. And he built it when he was 20, I don't know, was he 20 yet, Charlotte? I don't know. 20, 21, but, somewhere. Uh, so, so it kind of worked. And I, you have to thank the Lord put that in our minds. Right. You know, cause we, and he also put the example of it in the Bible because yeah, the kingdom of God is a family and, business. And Abraham, think about it. Abraham, Abraham Isaac, Isaac, and Jacob. Jacob. I mean, and I, I sort of use that right there as a model, that family. Mm-hmm. And um, so it, it really, it wasn't that I was thinking of, well, let's build this thing where we have generational wealth. I wasn't thinking about that. I was thinking I want to work with my kids and mm, be around my grandbabies. So good. And so that's kind of where the second company came from, Tradeway. And uh, Tradeway has been a great blessing. And, you know, I used to think that I can do just about anything. I thought, yeah, I'm going to pr- prove to the world I'm a good manager. And um, so I think I only lost about a million and a half on Tradeway the first five years while I was running it. Finally, Katie got out of college, and I said, here, 
take this, please. And she's got the gift of administration that the Bible talks about. So she runs that company like tight, you know. Mm. And, it, it, and then we met you. We came to one of Myron's four-day four event, I believe Back it was. Then, yeah. mm -hmm. And um, <clears throat> the company, Tradeway, what it, it wasn't called that at the beginning, but <clears throat> same company, was doing so badly, we just shut everything down, moved everything into Katie and Dave's garage with that company. Not the oil company, but that company moved it into their garage, cut, let everybody go, cut the, cut the overhead to nothing, except we had a little bit. I think actually we were paying Katie and Dave with oil, oil field money, oil, oil company money. So we shut it all down, and we had this one product that was a financial product where I was basically teaching people how to do what I know about stock market, and we put that on the shelf, and Charlotte said, why don't you go to one of Brother Myron's meetings? And I said, why wouldn't I want to do that? And she said, because you'll just have fun with Myron. And I said, oh. Well, take Dave and Katie. Oh, yeah. So I said, it's a done deal. So we flew out there. And I don't know, maybe morning of the second day, Katie's sitting here. She's known Myron Helder as a baby, you know. She's sitting up there like this. And Myron said, Katie, man. Katie Huber at that time, wasn't it? <laughs> Katie Huber, uh, what's, what's the matter? He stopped the whole lesson. Like the lesson. I've never seen her mad yeah, before. Yeah, like the and lesson she was he's going to be teaching later this morning. I mean, she you know? was hot. And she was mad. And she said, my dad spent tens of thousands of dollars and sent me to, I won't name the university. Four years of college. Four years of college in marketing. They didn't teach anything like this man's <laughs> teaching, like you're teaching, Brother Myron. It's just she, terrible. Oh, this is awesome. And, like, and honestly, I don't know if you guys, I'm sure you, if you've come to some of his teaching on business, I was sitting there saying, I'm not saying for the whole four days, I'm going to go home and do what I learned today, right now. You know, <laughs> I got to get on the plane now and get started on this stuff. It was that good. We literally went home. We didn't know how to price this product. We didn't know how to sell it in a, we wanted to do it in hotel room, you know, conference rooms with 200 people or whatever, 50, 20 would be fine. And we didn't know how to do it. And that course was about that. We went home and we knew how to do it. We didn't believe it would work. We thought, thought it was just Myron. He, and he, if you're Myron, yeah, you can do that, right? Has anybody ever had that thought? How many of you ever had that thought? Okay. So honestly, honestly, like the stuff he does, for one thing, I don't know if you can tell, but our personal, personalities are kind of, we're attracted to each other. Let's just say it that way. We're opposite, right? So I'm, I'm laid back and I'll sit here like, I preach like this. If this is the pulpit. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, let's open the Bible to Genesis chapter 3. By then, he's already down the aisle, you know. <laughs> so we're a little different. So I didn't think I could do the stuff. He said, David, you have to present like this. And I'm going, ew, that's you, you know. But I swear, Dave, stand up back there where they can see you a little bit. I know they can't see you up here. But my son-in-law, Dave, was sitting back there saying, I can do this. I'm just like Myron, <laughs> you know. And so now I call him little Myron. But... But I, I tried my best to do it like you taught, and the first time we had it close, I couldn't even look because I didn't think it would work. And I went out the side door of the hotel and didn't look, mm -hmm. and Dave was at the back uh, table getting swamped. And I, half the people in the room bought our product that day. So we went to profitability um, that first year after we went to his seminar from, from losing a million and a half for five years. So... Went to profitability. The next year, we were a multi-million dollar company in sales. I, I mean, I don't know how many Yeah, it was, it, was, it, was, it was pretty insane. And here's what's crazy. interesting. The difference between where you are and where you'd like to be is exactly the same as the difference between what you know and what you have not learned and implemented yet. Because that same product that made their company profitable, they had already been attempting to sell it for years for like 260 bucks and nobody right. was buying it. <laughs> yeah. And then, all of a sudden, they're selling the exact same content for back then $15,000 and people were just banging down the doors to get it. Yeah, I, I thought he was crazy. <laughs> I, I showed it to him. He, I said, he says, what, you, what are you going to sell it for? I said, I don't know. We talked about it for a couple of years, <laughs> 285. He, got, he went, David, that's a $15,000 product. And I, my brain is going, nobody will pay that for that. <laughs> he said, the, the, the price is irrelevant. It doesn't because the materials are made. He knew the material. In fact, he was a stock trader before he saw him out. He'd done it on his own, which I didn't really know that, but he was already a stock and options trader. And so he knew the value of that content. And mm -hmm. it was awesome. Yeah. Thank and, you, my brother. Well, thank you. Um, <laughs> we have a mutual admiration society. <laughs> um, so, interestingly enough, a lot of people who are Bible believers would listen to us talk right now about the stock market and they'll 
I'll get a little irritated and say, but that's like gambling. What does the Bible say about that? And, and the first thing that comes to my mind is Matthew 25. I don't know what the first thing that comes to your mind is. But, um, I, and I heard you do a teaching on Matthew 25 one time. And I've done teachings on Matthew 25. But when I heard yours, I was like, <gasps> how did I miss that? Mm. So yeah. what do you well, say? You know to- what's funny? That, mm. You remember how when we started, we, we didn't know how to do the how to put people in the seats at all. Mm-hmm. And you were going around speaking to different kinds of groups. Mm-hmm. And sometimes you were putting 60 people in the room to, to 200, mm-hmm. kind of like that. Mm-hmm. And Myron was kind enough. This was right after he taught us how to do this, right, with the stock market stuff. He was kind enough to let me follow him around the country. He said, look, you come in. It usually was at least a two-day mm-hmm. meeting, sometimes four-day meeting mm-hmm. he was doing. He, can, he said, you can have an hour and a half and present whatever you want about your thing. And he kind of taught me what to do. So, so I had this little presentation called the Echo Principle, and they could buy it for My 250 boy. bucks. And if they bought it, they got two free tickets to, to the huge Tradeway seminar that's going to happen live in their city, mm. which wasn't going to happen. We didn't have any yet. <laughs> I mean, it was going to happen, but, I mean, it wasn't scheduled. We didn't know, you know. So what would happen? I didn't know because we'd never done it. So every time I followed him into a room, half the people bought that product, that 250 thing, and they got the two free tickets. So Dave would get on the phone and go book a room, <laughs> you know, three weeks out, and we'd invite him in. And we'd have, you know, 15 people, and it became, even with 15 people, it became big profitable that year, mm. just doing that. So good. So that, that little lesson called the Echo Principle is something that I got from that chapter, Matthew 25. And I don't know if you remember the story, you learned it in Sunday school probably as a kid, uh, where the master was going to go on a trip and he was going to put his finances in the hands of three men, the talents, the story of the talents, right? Okay. And you remember what, you know, two of them were successful and he blessed them, right? But what about that third one? He buried, he had no skill sets and he was fearful. So he buried the money in the ground. People don't realize the talents was money. It wasn't, Mm -hmm. it wasn't spiritual talents. You know, I understand that's the you right. know, that's an right. underlying teaching. It was a weight of, go- yeah. of gold usually. So yeah. he buries it. He comes back, hands it to him, and he rebukes him, punishes, takes away what he has, and gives it to the most productive person. Remember the story? And he asked, he brought him to task, and he said, why did you do that? You could have at least earned interest on it, which I find mm. interesting 2,000 years ago that they had interest at banks, but they did. And he said, well, two reasons. You're an aust- austere man, which means his countenance was... Rough. makes me think of Brother Otis. That's mm-hmm. a whole other story. But anyway, um, this older dude that joined our church, Bible teacher dude. But you're, it's austere and like I'm afraid of you. And secondly, you reap where you didn't sow. And I'm reading that one day. And see, see, like you said, I was a businessman before I got saved. I didn't get saved until I was 24. And I had two degrees in business running the oil company. Been running it since high school for my dad. And he, and so... I, I started reading the Bible when I got saved, and then when I got called to preach three or four years later and studying theology, I saw business principles everywhere oh, because everywhere, the, the yeah. Bible is a practical book. Exactly. So when I saw that, I never thought of it. I remember it from Sunday school, oh, it's your spiritual talents, which it is that. Mm-hmm. But the physical story behind it has to be true too. God would not use a physical story that's a lie to teach a spiritual truth. So... So all the physical part of that story is, that's where I find business principles, is in mm-hmm. the physical side of the spiritual stories that Jesus taught and even in the Old Testament that are taught. So I looked at that and I said, now what does that mean? He reaps where he didn't sow the seeds. And I thought, my goodness, I learned that at Baylor you know, Business School. It's called financial leverage. Mm-hmm. So you cannot create wealth with your own eight hours a day. You don't have enough time in life to create any, any kind of wealth whatsoever. You'll never trade hours for dollars and get wealthy ever. That's why Tradeway has so many engineers and lawyers and doctors as students. You, you guys think they're, they're rich, not. right? They, they don't think they, they know that if they hurt their hand, they can't operate anymore. Their money is gone. So they want to learn to get their money working and making money. So they come to me, see, so, but, but that leverage. So this guy was not, he had, he paid a fair wage to many thousands of people, most likely to plant seeds on all of his lands and he earned a little profit off of all their efforts and paid them well too. And that's called leverage. And that's how wealth is created. So that, that is what I taught it when I'd follow him around. And I would, what I would show him is the best thing you can leverage. If you want to leverage the smartest minds, the people on Wall Street are the smartest people in the world about money. And so you can leverage their, their brain. You can leverage their money. 
and you can leverage their time and use that to, to benefit your family. And that's what mm. we teach at Tradeway all around the country. But, mm. um, so good, Dave. Uh, but that idea of leverage, it doesn't have to be... Uh, I mean, we teach people to start a stock trading business with their kids because it's the lowest entry of any business. It's cheaper than getting in a multi-level deal. You don't have to buy the kid, right? Mm-hmm. It, it's cheap. Like, you can't buy a McDonald's anymore. And if you want to try to get into oil business today, forget that. You, you're not going to do it as an individual today. So... Uh, you can open a brokerage account for nothing and then go have a garage sale and raise 1500 bucks and send it up there and start trading and change your life. You have mm. the potential. It gives you enormous potential to change your life. And mm. so that's, that's what we teach that's to so use good. it as a tool, though. The stock trading is just a tool to create the family business because you can teach your kids and grandkids those skill sets. So, mm. so good. So good. So, so a couple things. I want to say, because we're, we're, we're a little limited on time, and I'm going to ask you in a minute like where people can come and find out more from you. But we're going to have links to everything regarded to David Mitchell and Tradeway and everything in the description. Um, but so I've learned a lot of things from a lot of people. But in the arena of how to be wealthy, you know, I talk a lot about be, do, have. Um, in the arena of how to be wealthy... I've learned more solid wealth building principles from watching him than maybe anything else I've ever done. And I'm not just saying that. I can remember, so your grandfather, E.G. Hall, the accountant, I used to go to the oil, to the office with you, to the E.G. Hall Oil Company office in Mejia, and I thought, his name's David Mitchell, who is E.G. Hall. (laughs) I didn't learn that until many decades later. Anyway, and I can remember watching you sitting there doing all your oil company stuff, and then you start doing church stuff. Like for the church. And I'm thinking, okay. And so I'm like, what are you doing? Well, church secretary needs a car, (laughs) so he buys her car. Well, the church needs a bus. I'm like, who does this? (laughs) Yeah, you it, thought I was a little too comfortable with money. Well, no, I didn't even think you were too comfortable. I just didn't, no, I didn't just, understand you, it. It yeah, didn't make any sense. Like, I thought, I thought, like a lot of people think before they know somebody who's rich, we have all these opinions about people that we have never met. And so I'm thinking rich people are, are snooty and flaunty. And like, I met him, only, like the first millionaire I ever met. And, and this was, I met him in 19. 19- 82. I met him in 1980, but that was a different environment. I met him. I came to his house. Yeah. Yeah. I came to his house, stayed at his house for Christmas when I went to go meet my wife's family before she was my wife, my girlfriend's family for that Christmas holiday when I was, when I was in college and it's 1982 and he's driving and he's, he's a millionaire. He's got an oil well in his front yard. I probably shouldn't tell everybody that, but I, I, that's (laughs) That's what I remembered. Right. I'm thinking he's got an oil Uh well in his front yard. So this is how they do it. Okay. And then, and then (laughs) pumps while you're sleeping. And then I like that. There's another principle we could talk about. (laughs) Exactly. How do you build oil wells? It makes you money while you sleep. There you go. You've been building oil wells ever since you left my house. Exactly. Yeah. Different kinds of oil wells. That's a different kind. So, and, and, but then he's driving a 1974 Cutlass Supreme. I'm like, wait, I thought he was rich. Why is he driving this 1974, this eight-year-old Cutlass? Like, it's not a Cadillac. It's not, it's not a Mercedes. It's not a BMW. It's a Cutlass Supreme. What are we doing here? So, so it just made me realize early how many erroneous things we believe about wealth. And there are so many people out there buying things that make them look rich but are costing them the money they could use to get rich. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so David, how can people like, like reach out to you, learn more, get connected with you? Because if you've blessed my life this much and I'm going to, I'm going to, I, I don't, I don't want to embarrass you, but is it okay if I tell the story about how, is that okay? Which one? <laughs> the real summer embarrassing okay, one. Or not. <laughs> All right. I trust you. Go okay. ahead. So I, if I don't like it, I'll tell. One. So, um, yeah, there you go. <laughs> there you go. Um, so y'all have heard me tell the story about how we went, my family and I, we went through like seven years of tragedy and then like we got audited by the IRS and like they told me I owed them a million sixty-five thousand dollars and my tax litigation consultant told me I needed to go broke and make a deal. So literally like I went from being a multimillionaire to broke as a joke and ready to choke. 
And this man and his family loaned me $4,000 a month for two years so I could live. That's money back then. Oh, that was money back We've then. We've had a little inflation since that. Time. We've had a little inflation, but, but this is not just somebody who theorizes about being a godly, wealthy, caring person. This is the friend that's born for adversity or the brother that's born for, because I always call him my brother from another mother. In fact, when we're playing golf sometimes, we'll, we'll introduce ourselves to me. Oh, yeah, this is my brother, Dave. And they'll look at me like, <laughs> oh, and I always say, same father, different mother. Yeah, <laughs> yeah and, and if that, like they're, on the golf course. Now they're really course, confused, right? If, if they're cursing every other word, he'll say, they'll, eventually the fourth hole, they'll say, what do you guys do? He'll say, we're both preachers. <laughs> <laughs> like, we're brothers, right? And, and we're preachers. preachers. You don't hear a word a for six, you know, all the whole rest of the time. It's anyway. great. So how can, how, can folks, how can folks get in touch with you, David? All right. Well, I, I would say just go out to tradeway.com, like trade, like a stock trade, tradeway.com. And um, you, can, you can take advantage of a, like a free strategy session. And then my staff will take care of you from there because we got we got so many we got over forty something strategies you can't do them all so they'll have to guide you through where you where you start and where yeah. you go from there and they'll be happy to do that and help so you find something that matches you <clears throat> yeah it's a, you have you don't ever do all those it, you everyone has a personality and you, and you have a certain risk tolerance or lack thereof you know and so you pick strategies that fit you and you need maybe you know six or seven of them because the market. <laughs> does all kinds of things and you need certain strategies to fit where the market is today. But that, mm, they'll, they'll take you right step by step. And the thing that's cool about our company, and we started this early on, is we realized it's kind of scary. So the, the material is fun. When you get into the material of trading, it's not like investing in, in annuities and different things that may seem bored to you if you've ever, if you've ever had a presentation like that. It's trading is fun. <clears throat> so that part's fun, but when you start to do your first trade, it's a little frightening. So we hold your hand. We've got coaches, mm. got fantastic, probably the best coaching system in the country. Um, live webinars where we get a coach on there with a whole bunch of students and pick stocks and trade them right there together live, stuff like that. So Good they'll stuff. hook you up, tradeway.com, and just Good uh, stuff. find out how to get a free strategy session. Or, well, I would love this conversation to last a lot longer, but we have another session we've got to do. Yes. David, thank you for being here. Thank you for sharing with thank a you. bunch of people that I love, like your wisdom, your knowledge, your expertise. I appreciate you more than I can put into words. Thanks for watching. Stay blessed by the best. You can find all of the tradewaybud.com and then any other links to his YouTube channel, all the rest of that social media. You guys will have access to that when the video airs. So congratulations for being in the right place at the right time. In the meantime, in between time, we'll see you in the next video. Peace out, Cub Scouts.